Hello everyone, my name is David Connolly and in this video I want to give you a quick overview as to why thermal storage is so much cheaper than electricity storage and why it is so important that we start utilizing it more in the future. To do that I'm going to compare a type of electricity storage with a type of thermal storage. So to begin let's start by looking at electricity storage. The type of electricity storage I've chosen here today is the most common type of electricity storage currently installed around the world. So it's pumped hydroelectric energy storage. And this consists of two reservoirs of water that are usually constructed in a mountainous area where you have one reservoir at the bottom and one reservoir at the top. And the way that you store energy is by pumping water from the lower reservoir up to the to upper reservoir using a tunnel uh, or that's that, that connects both of them together and that's can usually driven by a pump turbine unit and what I just want to emphasize just firstly is that this unit is usually made up of two key characteristics firstly its storage capacity which is de defined by the size of the of the water tank and the second thing is the power capacity which is defined by the size of the the pump turbine unit or the tunnel that connects the reservoirs together so you have to create a relationship between these two when you're defining the cost of this plant and to do that I've taken a very typical case where the plant is um, designed with a six to eight hours of charge and the reason that that has happened in the past is because these plants have been used to primarily balance the day or night difference in our consumption so on the right hand side you'd see just a, a typical case where in the night time between the hours of midnight and eight in the morning we have a very low electricity demand while during the day it increases it then peaks in the evening time and then it decreases uh, later into the night as people go to bed again and in the past we've used nuclear or coal power power to provide this base load electricity that's required all around the day and this base load is typically the cheapest form of electricity and to increase that the pumped hydro plants have been installed so they can charge during the night time and discharge during the daytime and by doing so they've been able to increase the amount of base load operation that we've had on our system so what I've done is assumed that uh, this is the typical size of the pumped hydro plant when I've created the cost and so what I've done is I've made up a hypothetical plant where we have a thousand megawatts of power capacity and to take into account the eight hours of charge it means we have 1000 multiplied by the eight hours of charge 8000 megawatt hours is the size of our reservoir and that's just to explain how I've come up with my ratio because this can be very important when you're defining a typical price for a pumped hydro plant and of course it can mean that the price of different pumped hydro plants varies significantly from one to the other then using a typical investment cost of 1 million euro per megawatt I just want to highlight that this is very much at the lower end of the scale there's some studies that report 3 to 4 million euro per megawatt but I've assumed a relatively conservative one here of 1 million euro per megawatt means that this 1000 megawatt plant would cost around 1 billion euro to construct then looking at the amount of energy it stores I've divided that 1 billion euro by the 8000 megawatt hours giving me a storage cost a unit investment cost of 125 euros per kilowatt hour and the reason I've spent a lot of effort getting to this number is because this number is how I will compare pumped hydro uh, with alternative thermal storage facilities so just keep that number 125 euros per kilowatt hour in mind and let's move now to the thermal storage facilities so large thermal storage facilities usually come in two different types first type is a hot water steel tank so it's a steel tank full of hot water and the other option is a hole in the ground filled with hot water so this is commonly referred to as pit thermal storage and if we look at the typical cost for these type of units a hot water steel tank is usually around three euros per kilowatt hour to build and a pit storage is usually around 50 cent per kilowatt hour to build so comparing these two with one another you could say that the the thermal storage if you take a pit storage costs around 50 cent per kilowatt hour whereas the pumped hydro plant costs around 125 euros per kilowatt hour of course the if i take in the steel tank it would have been three euros per kilowatt hour so you could say that thermal storage is in the region of 50 to 200 times cheaper then electricity storage to construct another important thing is that this pumped hydro plant is very dependent on mountainous terrain so it can only be constructed where there's a suitable mountain in place whereas this pit storage can be built pretty much anywhere or even the steel tanks is the same for that matter because the steel tanks can be constructed anywhere above the ground while the pit storage can be built anywhere you can dig a hole in the ground so it's not just about the price but it's also about the flexibility but overall we typically conclude looking at 
prices because of course they vary from plant to plant we conclude that electricity storage is around 100 times more expensive than thermal storage another interesting thing to look at is the typical thermal storage plants that are constructed in denmark so on the left side you see the size of the thermal storage plants and on the bottom you see the number of these plants and what we can see is that the pit storages are these ones at the very beginning which are the really big ones and they only account for about five or ten plants overall at the moment although the number of plants is increasing more and more as we use more renewable energy however it's very much hot water tanks that make up the most of thermal storage in denmark today which is the remaining let's say 200 and 250 or 200 and 60 or so plants that are constructed around Denmark. So in total, there's around 280 thermal storage facilities, with the vast majority of those being these hot water steel tanks. And then interestingly, just to give you a context, if you add up the total thermal storage available in Denmark, it's around 50 gigawatt hours. And sometimes people think that a hot water tank couldn't possibly be at the same scale as a large pumped hydro facility. But just to put this in context, Britain has 60 million people and it has four pumped hydro plants that have a total storage of 30 gigawatt hours, whereas Denmark has five and a half million people. But because it has so many of these large thermal storage facilities, it has actually a combined capacity of 50 gigawatt hours, which is actually more than the pumped hydro facilities in Britain. So it's just to tell you that if you wanted to put this scale in context, 50 gigawatt hours of thermal storage is an enormous amount of, of energy storage. Also, I just want to end by highlighting that the only reason that these thermal storage facilities can be used in Denmark is because Denmark implemented district heating uh, plants. So it, because district heating is in place, we can use these thermal storage facilities. Whereas in Britain, there isn't thermal uh, district heating in place at the moment. So this is something that needs to be implemented in order to access this thermal storage in the future. And because thermal storage is so cheap, this is a very good idea according to our calculations. The second thing I want to just focus on a bit is the size. I've uh, talked very much about comparing electricity and thermal storage so far, but what happens if we move to a, a different scale? So, so far I focused very much on the central plants, but what happens if we look at the smaller scale? So like the, 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 the storage you can put in your house, for example. And let's uh, take, for example, a very commonly spoken about electricity storage for the home right now is the Tesla Powerwall. And that costs around three and a half thousand dollars. So let's say around three thousand euro and it has a capacity of around 10 kilowatt hours. So the price for that unit is around 300 euros per kilowatt hour. That sounds uh, very a uh, low price in general but that's uh, what's being quoted right now and, and and also just to say that these tesla power walls are not very common right now whereas in contrast if we were to use a thermal storage in the home almost every home has a hot water tank at, at least in countries that don't have district heating the cities almost everyone has a thermal hot water tank in their home and those, those would typically be around 200 liters although they're nowadays they're even providing them up to a thousand liters but let's say a typical example of 200 liters would cost you around 800 euro and have a capacity of nine kilowatt hours so around 90 euros per kilowatt hour so this is just to say that when we look at the smaller scale thermal storage is still cheaper than electricity storage but now of course this the difference is much less now it's around a third of the price whereas before it was in the region of 50 to 100 times cheaper um, but again i just want to highlight that this thermal storage is used extensively almost in every building today whereas this electricity storage is a brand new product on the market looking at all of these together there's two really important points to take from all of this the first thing is that thermal storage is cheaper than electricity storage so we should utilize that wherever we can if possible and the second thing is that large storage is cheaper than smaller storage so we should be moving in the direction of thermal at the bigger scale this is the cheapest way for us to access energy storage when looking at all of these options and over the next uh, few decades this is going to become much more important because obviously cheap energy storage means we can use more renewable energy which is becoming a key target for a lot of countries around the world right now and i want to give you two examples of how this cheap thermal storage can help us use more renewable energy and not just renewable heating but also more renewable electricity such as wind and solar power so let's start by looking at a, a, a thermal option or heating option this is a town called Marstel uh, in Denmark which has solar thermal uh, panels 
and a pit storage installed. So if we look at the right hand side, you can see these like line areas. These are all the solar thermal panels. And this box area with the X on it is the large pit thermal storage plant. And because they have such a large thermal storage facility, this district heating plant in Denmark is able to balance the solar production in the summertime with the demand for heat in the winter. So if we look at the production from that plant, you can see this yellow area here that highlights the production from the solar panels. But you can see that the demand is much lower than the production in the summer. So this kind of bright yellow outlines how the solar collectors are actually charging that large thermal storage plant. And of course, the solar dies away during the winter months, but this stored energy during the summer can actually be used during the winter months by discharging the large thermal storage facility. So because the thermal storage is so cheap, we can build enormous amounts of it to the extent that we can actually store summer heat and provide it use in the, in the winter time when the solar production is very low. And using this very large thermal storage facility, the plant in Marstel is actually now providing over 50% of its annual heating demand using solar thermal panels. So that means it's balancing out the variability over a whole year using this large thermal storage tank. So that's really increasing the potential for using solar to provide our heating needs. But what about the electricity side? On the electricity side, things are a bit more complicated to explain. So I just want to start by talking about the energy system. So if we look at the historical energy system, we typically looked at different demands separately. So we typically had transport, electricity, and then heating and cooling. And each of these were looked at in an isolated way. So electricity was provided with power plants, transport was provided with engines, and heating, heating was provided with boilers. So each of these sectors is very isolated from one another. So for the heating sector, you typically used a boiler that was powered by either oil or natural gas. However, what we try to highlight in the smart energy system concept is the importance of connecting these different sectors to one another. Because by connecting these different sectors to one another, you can start to improve the efficiency and the flexibility of your energy system. And I want to just give you one example of that using thermal storage uh, as, 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 a, as a case study. So if you take, for example, there's a lot of wind and solar power being produced, so a lot of electricity production from wind and solar power, that extra wind and solar power can be used to power a heat pump or electric boiler, which can be used to produce our heating needs. However, if there's an imbalance, if this wind power is being produced at a time that the heat demand is not required, then we can use this cheap thermal storage to balance our variability. And the wonderful thing about all of this is that this is not something that has to be invented. This is something that is already happening today. And to demonstrate that, I'm going to take the statistics from, or the data, sorry, from a district heating plant in Denmark for December 2013 over a typical uh, week. So you can see that the, the time is here on the bottom. And you can see this is how this district heating plant operated over these six or seven days or so. And I'm not going to go into all of the details. I just want to highlight how wind power is being balanced using thermal storage in this district heating plant. To do that, I want to take this, the first points I want to take are these two key areas here. And what's happening here, if I zoom in a bit, is that this green line illustrates that the electricity price in Denmark is decreasing significantly. And the reason the electricity price is so low is because there's so much wind power being produced. In other words, there's so much wind power being produced, so some of it isn't even needed, which drives the price of electricity down really low. The people operating the district heating plant see this opportunity for very low electricity prices, so they turn on their electric boiler at the district heating plant, because this electric boiler can consume very cheap electricity. So this, uh, from point one to point two, you can see the electric boiler switched on, consuming this cheap electricity. Then the electricity price goes up again, so the electric boiler switches off. And however, later on, the electricity price drops again, and the electric boiler switches on once more. However, even though the electric boiler was operating and producing the heat, the consumers didn't need the heat at that time. So if we look at the bottom chart, what we can see is that the thermal storage facility was actually char was filling up during these hours because we didn't need the heat during these hours. So effectively what you're doing here is you're storing excess wind power as thermal heat in the thermal storage facility. Later on then you can see that the electric boiler switches off, but ironically at that time, 
uh, when the electric boiler switches off, the consumers did need their heat. So if we zoom in again, you can see the electric boiler is switching off. And the reason the electric boiler is switched off is not because the consumer didn't need the heat, but because the price of electricity had gone up quite substantially again. So the price of electricity was too expensive to keep operating the electric boiler. So instead then of continuing to operate the electric boiler, what has actually happened at point three is that the thermal storage tank starts to empty. In other words, the thermal storage starts to use the heat that it stored earlier to provide the demands that the consumers now have. So effectively what has happened here is that wind power was stored earlier in the day and is now being used to supply the needs of the consumers. So effectively, we've connected excess wind power to the demands for consumers' heat at a different time. And this is how you're balancing excess wind with thermal storage facilities. And as I mentioned, this is already happening today. That data was from 2013. And the wonderful thing about all of this is that this excess wind power that's balanced using thermal storage is using an energy storage that is about 100 times cheaper than what the price would have been if it was relying on electricity storage. So as I demonstrated earlier, the thermal storage is around one euro per kilowatt hour, while the electricity storage is around 125 euros per kilowatt hour. So we're saving a lot of money on our energy storage by actually balancing using the thermal storage facility versus the electricity storage option. This is something we consider in a lot of the modeling work that we do. We have a model called Energy Plan, which you can find out a lot more details about at energyplan.eu. And this is the model we use in the Heat World Map Europe series to highlight these synergies that can cre be created across the electricity, heating and transport sectors going forward into the future. So we, we do this uh, in, in, to, to, to demonstrate how you can use cheap energy storage. The final point I want to make about all of this is that quite often district heating is looked at uh, from a city perspective, because this map here, for example, from Britain outlines the potential for district heating around the country. And as you can see, the potential is very much focused in on the city areas. However, wind power is very much a national agenda and national strategy. And we're using the district heating system and the thermal storage facilities on the district heating system to balance this wind power in the case study that I just presented to you. So what I want to highlight is that even though district heating is a city solution, it's actually helping solve a national problem. So a lot of the time in the policy debates, we often leave the district heating system to the city politicians and policymakers, while we leave wind power to the national policymakers. But I just want to highlight how this case illustrates how this cannot be divided into two discussions. And instead, we need to combine it because district heating, although it's a local solution, it's helping solve a national strategy towards more wind and solar power. So we need to make sure we have a holistic discussion around how these technologies are complementing one another. Furthermore, I just have discussed electricity and thermal storage in this video. However, our smart energy systems concept also includes fuel storage, which is even cheaper again. And you can find out more about that about going to smartenergysystem.eu. Here are some links that may also be useful that have some data that I've used in the presentation today. And otherwise, that concludes my presentation, which I hope you found interesting. You can hear, find out more on the website heatroadmap.eu. Follow us on Twitter or subscribe to the YouTube channel where we have many other videos to explain some of the key characteristics of the energy system. Thanks very much for listening.